Yeah, thank you so much uh, for having me here today. Thank you for joining this uh, talk. And uh, yes, so uh, this presentation is based on a joint work make with Casey McCoy. And uh, I would like to discuss with you um, how the Hubble constant controversy shed, can shed light on uh, the discussion we're having on replicability in more general philosophy of science. So, you might be aware that actually in the philosophy of science and literature, there has been a growing interest in replicability. And um, um, there have been like three main issues that philosophers aim to tackle. So the first issue is on the status of replicability. And so whether replicability is actually a necessary criterion for science or a demarcation criterion between science and pseudoscience. Then the second issue is on the meaning of replicability. What does it mean to be able to pass a replication test? What does it mean to build a replication experiment? And then the third issue is on the epistemic functions of replication. And in this talk, uh, we will be concerned with the third issue particularly. However, we are kind of aware that uh, all the three issues are interrelated. So only once we know the epistemic functions of replications, we are able to know how to build a replication study. And we can also better evaluate whether replicability is a necessary criterion for science. And our main claim is that the epistemic functions of replications are very tied to the kinds of error that uh, we want to eliminate that might affect our results, our experimental results, but that we want to eliminate. Okay? So basically, the epistemic functions of replications should be understood by attending to the kinds of error in experimental science. And we will use the Hubble constant controversy as a case study to support this claim. This approach is pretty new because contemporary discussions on replications are actually primarily informed by cases from psychology. And we do not think that this is actually a very wise approach because psychology is one of the disciplines that is going through the so-called replication crisis. And the reason why it's going through the replication crisis is probably due to the fact that it's based on qualitative and inexact methods. So we think that it's much more fruitful to go into exact uh, quantitative disciplines like astrophysics or cosmology, which are not going through a replication crisis, which normally deal with replication problems very well, and to see how actually it's the methodology of replication in those sciences. Okay, so for those of you who might not be familiar with the literature in replication and general philosophy of science, just let me tell you um, of the, the general um, the general pictures. So normally in psychology, we distinguish between the two different kinds of replication, direct and conceptual replication. And philosophers normally inherit these distinctions. So we have two categories. On one hand, we have direct replications. And uh, in this case, the replication experiment or study adopts the very same methodology of an original one. So basically it's a the very same duplication of the original experiment, except for irrelevant elements or factors. For instance, if in the original experiment, I have a sample which is representative of the whole population, then of course in my replication study, I can resample from the very same population. Then the second category is, as I said, a conceptual replication. And basically, conceptual replication studies or exper experiment test the very same hypothesis as the original experiment, but they do so in a different way. And so with a very different uh, methodology. Okay. So then in 2020, Marshall, a uh, philosopher of science from Pittsburgh, published a break breakthrough contributions in a philosophy of science journal, uh, where basically he forcefully critiques the, this taxonomy that I just sketched out. So his claim is that the category of conceptual replication is incoherent and for this reason should be abandoned. So his understanding of replication, which uh, is uh, in uh, this kind of 
account resampling our counter of replication is the following. So every experiment or every study has actually different components. For instance, experimental units or the treatments or the methods. And each of these components can be treated either as fixed factor, which means that its levels of interest are fixed or random factors, which means that we can actually sample its levels of interest. And uh, then uh, replication consists of resampling components that are regarded as random factors and resampling them from the same population, okay? So then uh, the problem is, okay, we have conceptual replications. Normally conceptual replications are those replications that change methodological components okay, of the experiment. Okay, But then we should ask within the machinery uh, framework, are these components fixed or random? So suppose that they are random, and then we resample them from the same population, okay? Then we get, you know, normal replications, like all the other replications that we have, and that sample random components from the very same population. And methodological components do not have a special status. So they are just like treatment components or experimental units components. So we don't have any reason to call those replication that resample methodological components with another name like conceptual replication. They are just the replications. Suppose now that actually these factors, these uh, methodological components are random, but then we resample them not from the same population, from a but from a different population. Then we are targeting a more general hypothesis. And so these are extensions. These are not replications. Suppose now that these components are fixed, then when we change them, we are not performing an act of resampling. We are just performing other ex experiments. We are targeting a different hypothesis. So within this kind of framework, there is no need for introducing the concept of conceptual replication, which if we try to fit it, um, it appears rather confused. So in our paper, we actually, agree with Mashari's critique that actually we should not distinguish a direct and conceptual replication just by um, referring to the kind of component that is changed, whether it's the methodological components or experimental units or treatments or other components. However, we do think that it would be a serious mistake to abandon the category of conceptual replications, because actually conceptual replications are used in experimental practice. So what Mashuri calls the uh, replication in general, they actually are just checking reliability because they are acts of resampling from the very same population. So they check for reliability, for precision. Okay? On the other hand, um, uh, scientists also use conceptual replications uh, to check validity and accuracy. And we think that both the components, reliability and validity, are essential aspects of conforming scientific practice, and that the role of replication is exactly to conform a scientific hypothesis or result. Okay, so now let me um, present the Hubble constant controversy to actually, and to use it to actually shed light on uh, um, why uh, both validity and reliability are essential components and why replications is essential to check for validity and reliability. And so to support the claim that we should not abandon the concept of conceptual replication. So as you may all know, of course, the Hubble constant is the quantity that represents the present rate of spatial expansion of the universe. And determining its value is really important because, of, for instance, if we know the Hubble constant, we can even probably know the age of the universe. We can even maybe um, even predict what the eventual fate of the universe is going to be. 
And of course, there are many different methods of measuring the Hubble constant. But here we just focus on two different methods. Okay. Um, and uh, so the first method is really by looking at the global features of the early universe. So for instance, the cosmic microwave background radiations, and at the same time by assuming the Lambda CDM model. So if we do this, we are able to indirectly constrain the value of uh, the Hubble constant. So the most, uh, um, uh, reliable results that we get uh, about the cosmic microwave background from the European Space Agency's Planck satellite. And with those kind of data, we get a value of the Hubble constant, which is a 67.4 kilometers per sec per megaparsec. We an uncertainty of less than 1%, so it's a very precise result. On the other hand, we have a second uh, uh, mainstream method, which is by looking at local features of the late universe, in particular intergalactic, intergalactic um, distances. Um, and in this way, we are able to more or less directly um, measure or constrain the, um, the value of the Hubble constant. So we have to basically build a cosmic distance ladder that let us know about the distances from our from us to um, objects within our galaxies and objects in other galaxies. And then we can use the equation that relates velocity, recession velocity relative to Earth, and then the distance of these objects to actually calculate the best fit value for the Hubble constant. Okay. And within this kind of approach, Schuh's team led by RIS has been one of the most reliable program and the value that they get is 73.2 kilometers per sec per megaparsec with an uncertainty of less than 2%, 1.8. So this is also a very good result, very precise. The problem is that this result reveals a significant discrepancy with the Planck result. So now let me tell you a little bit more how the cosmic distance ladder is built. So of course it involves a variety of different astronomical objects and techniques for different distances. And then we need to find out some kind of intermediate distances where actually different kinds of techniques can be used, can be applied so that the different techniques can be calibrated one to the other. So that basically each step or rung of the ladder relies upon the previous step for calibration. And then for further distances, we use the standard candles, which are those stars about which we know their intrinsic brightness, okay? So as I said, we have different techniques for different distances, okay? So for more distance, for smaller distances, we have more kind of geometrical techniques like the parallax for intermediate distances. We have, um, in, in the case of the Hubble constants, the C-feed variable star, because basically their brightness, their intrinsic brightness is proportionally related to the position, position period of uh, these stars. And so basically the longer the period, the brighter the star. And so by knowing the position, by knowing their apparent brightness, we can also calculate their intrinsic brightness. And then for even larger distances for the Hubble constants, so the Schuss team um, relies on type 1a supernova. Also in this case, we know their intrinsic brightness because at peak brightness, all type 1a supernovae actually are supposed to have a specific intrinsic brightness. Okay, so now we have this picture, right? So we have two different methods to measure the Hubble constant, and we have a discordance of results, right? So what accounts for it? So one, uh, um, one option, which is the one favored by Reese and the Schuss team, is that actually the Lambda CDM model phase. Okay, so we have to admit that it phase. Why the lambda CDM model? Because it's the lambda CDM models that tells us that the value of the Hubble constant that we get 
uh, by looking at the early universe so should be exactly the same as the one that we get uh, by looking at the local later universe. And this is because our universe is isotropic and so much changes. Okay? The second option is that one of the two experimental results is just wrong. And in this case, normally, um, physicists tend to favor the hypothesis that shoes a program is wrong because the cosmic distance ladder, as we saw, it's extremely complicated to build. And there are so many different sources of uh, uh, different kinds of errors, as we will see later. So then what happens? So in this uh, talk, we will just uh, focus on the second hypothesis and so that maybe the shoes um, result is wrong. And in order to check for this, um, um, astrophysicist Friedman has society the Carnegie Chicago Hubble program that adopts the local late universe approach based on building a cosmic distance ladder exactly like the shoes team. But then there is a difference. They use the tip of the red giant branch um, standard candles instead of the C figs for intermediate distances. So they still use a parallax for small distances. They still use type 1A one, one supernova for larger distance, but then they use the TRGP instead of C figs. Okay. And then they get a result which is exactly in the middle between the Planck result and the Schuss result, which is 69.06 kilometer per sec per megaparsec, also with a small uncertainty, less than 2%. At this point, we have three experimental programs, right? We have Planck, we have a Shoes, we have a CCH, which have produced a discordant result for the Hubble constant, okay? So just here, it's important to notice that the early universe Planck method is highly independent of Shoes and CCH, which are based on late universe cosmic distance letter methods. And then Shoes and CCH are just partly independent. So they are actually using the same standard candles for larger distances they just before in their use of intermediate distance standard candles. Right? And understanding how these degrees of independence and dependence function, then is actually the key to understand the um, roles of replication. So in our work, we actually assume that no program is presently in the position to argue that they have the right result and then the others are wrong. And we also assume that there is no clear evidence that one team or another is to blame for the discordance. And this is what is generally thought among the community. And the reason why we want to look at the history of this controversy is because actually this history has been characterized by a succession of replication experiments aimed at checking for errors aimed at um, resolving this controversy and checking for which of the experiment is the one to blame for. You're okay, right. so- Can I ask a question? Yes. What are the error bars sure. on these measurements? Sorry? Do those three measurements come with error bars? Yeah, so exactly. So basically, yes, um, they also have error bars, which I didn't uh, put here, maybe later. But yes, we will exactly talk about error bars uh, sooner. Okay. So I, I will show it to you in some slides. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you. Vera? Yeah, Vera, this is um, uh, Priya from uh, Zoom. Okay, so I'm a little worried about the use of the word blame here. Um, just wanted yeah. to point out, we can come back to it later. I think the yes. point is that, you know, we have a very successful paradigm and these are tensions in that paradigm. So I don't think it's a question of blame. So I'm, I just want to register my protest against the use of that word. Yeah. We can come yeah, back. Sure. Yeah, bye. We have, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, that's a very well <laughs> taken. Yes, thank you. Uh, I agree. Good. Yeah, I'll, I'll change this. Yes. And we will talk about this. Yeah. 
Good. So what are the kinds of error that might affect our measurement results? So we can have random errors, of course, which are normally the unpredictable errors so that lead to fluctuations around the main value. So upon repetition, we get values that are around the main, but um, they, they can occur in both directions, okay? And then, of course, when we have random errors, this uh, means a lack of precision in our measurement results. And then the second kind of errors are, of course, the systematics, which affect constantly um, our measurement result. Normally, they are kind of affecting the measurement device or the whole methodology, and they occur normally, but of course, there are exceptions in only one direction. So it's very difficult to detect them upon repetition. So they are kind of consistent error, and they, um, if they affect our measurement, then of course, it means that we have a lack of accuracy or, or validity. Then we can also distinguish between known and unknown errors, right? So in principle, both random and systematic errors can be unknown, but actually um, astrophysicists normally just talk about unknown systematic errors because, I mean, upon a repetition, right, we can actually clearly see random errors. We can take, uh, into, take in, uh, them into consideration. We can account for them just by looking at the mean value, by measuring the standard deviation, and so on and so forth. So what is really worrying is the unknown systematic errors. Okay, so just to like to focus on systematic errors. So when we are worried about systematic errors, normally we strive to identify the possible sources, right? So we try to come up with different conjecture, different hypotheses of what the possible sources are. And then we either try to eliminate our influence on the experiment, or we try to remove them and we correct them in the result, or we put a bounce on them and then include them as, as a kind of residual systematic error in the result. So we put the result plus uh, uh, minus the, um, the error. And uh, if we can do this, so then we have uh, known a systematic errors, okay? But if this process of Phase, and we are not able to identify possible sources of systematic error, we cannot eliminate and so on and so forth, then we have unknown systematic errors. Okay. So now that we have uh, um, really uh, talked about the different kinds of errors that might affect uh, our um, experimental results, let's uh, go back to the reason for discrepancy. So we said the one reason for it was the failure of the Lambda CDM model. Another reason was that one of the experiments was wrong, right? Okay, let's focus on this uh, second hypothesis and let's unpack them in light of uh, the different kinds of error that we have. So, of course, one possibility is that one or more of the experiments, Planck, Schuess, or um, CCH, underestimates this random error. Okay, so then if we decrease the precision of the results, then probably we will be able to find a sort of compatibility. Then a second um, option would be the one or more of the experiments underestimate its known a systematic error. Okay? And then the third option would be that one of the experiments has not accounted for unknown systematic error. And so then we really have to look for unknown systematic errors to overcome the discordance. And here it is where astrophysicists are actually using replications to check for every single hypothesis. So concerning hypothesis one, all the programs have substantially reduced their known error over the years in repetition with direct replications. So, for instance, uh, the Reese, uh, the the Schuster team led by Reese, uh, has um, 
kept uh, um, changing different uh, samples of the CFIDs. Okay, so they repeat their experiments by change, changing samples or feces. Of course, uh, um, we are kind of assuming that this uh, um, change and then this uh, direct replications are checking for precision only because in theory, it's just a change of sample. However, of course, we have to admit that when you change samples, um, of the CFIDs, even though they are of the same kind of uh, standard candles, yet there might be problems of met metallicity that maybe in one sample was more present than in the other. So you might also have a kind of slightly change in the kind of systematics. But in any case, ideally, what was done was really performing lots of direct application to check for the precision. So as you can see, these are exactly like the succession of the different direct replications. And as you can see, the error bar gets uh, shorter and shorter over time. Then we have systematic uh, errors, right? So hypothesis two and hypothesis three. Um, so basically, the challenge here is exactly to identify the cause of the discordance. Okay, so here um, we know that if we analyze the error well, okay, then and still we get different kinds of uh, we have a discordant results. So then there must be some unknown systematic errors. Okay. So in this case, the SHOES team and the TCH team have really tried to, to come up with different sources of, uh, um, of, uh, of uh, systematic errors, okay? So also in this case, they have really tried hard to come up with sources of systematic errors, and yet really they had discordant results. So then the problem was how to ferret out unknown systematic errors. Okay, if we look at the, how the, the old programs are developed, then we can see again what was done to really tackle the unknown systematic errors. So let's take a plank and shoes, right? So they, they are highly independent experiments, okay? So because of this highly indep high independence, then once we get discordant result, right? One can really infer that there must be some unknown systematic errors. So suppose that shoes has really taken seriously um, the effort to come up with hypotheses for systematic errors and the same for Planck, and yet we get different results. Then there must be some unknown um, systematic error, okay? But then we do not know where where these errors come from, right? So then it's really here that the CCH, the Carnegie Chicago Hubble program is really interesting because they come up with a conjecture by saying, well, look, maybe the problem is with the systematic of CFIs. And then they construct a partially dependent um, um, program which changes the uh, intermediate standard candle from C fix to TRG. So this is exactly why the CCH uh, um, program was born for. Okay, so we they were concerned about the accuracy of C fix. They had this conjecture, right? This is because the CFIX normally has lots of problems with systematic error, and there might be also problems that we're not really considering. So the shoe steamer were considering redony, metallicity, and other things, but there might be some systematic errors we're not aware. So then the TRGB method comes and says, look, we are very well sure about the brightness, the intrinsic brightness of the tip of the red giant branch star because they are determined by the helium flash phenomena that we understand very well. So um, probably this is the safest method to actually calculate the distance. 
And we can use this to test whether the source of systematic errors in the shoes program comes from the C feed. And so the standard candles used for intermediate distance. So basically, the CCH program she is the systematics with the shoes program for near and far distance, but then it's a different for the intermediate. And this is how basically we can handle systematic errors. Okay, and we can know where um, the, the problem, the source of the discordance is, what is responsible for the discordance. Of course, also the TRGB method might involve some systematic errors. Of course, we can't exclude this, right? But then, setting this aside, suppose that shoes and the CCH results has strongly be convergent, okay? Then, you know, we could say, well, then the source of the discordance is between, you know, plank, and uh, you know, um, shoes should not be really found in the intermediate distance candles. So it's not a problem of the C fit, right? Suppose, on the other hand, that the CCH results have been strongly convergent with the plank result, okay, but not with the shoes result. Then, of course, again, oh, it's a problem. Then it would be a problem of the C fix, okay? The, the C fix are the source of the problem here. There might be some unknown systematic errors affecting the C fix. So, one might think, okay, so what is a better? Is it better partial independence than high independence of replications? Because one can think, look, with high independence, we can know whether actually uh, the, um, um, whether there are some unknown results, right? And then partial independence reveals us maybe where. So we don't think that high independence is necessarily the best. We also don't think that partial uh, independence is the best, okay? Um, however, we have to acknowledge that suppose the Planck and Schuess experiments, which are highly independent, had given consistent results, then if this is so, then this would really constitute a stronger confirmation than a common result between a shoes and CCH experiment, okay? Why? Because exactly they are highly independent. So we have two very independent experiments. They reach the very same conclusion. And so for robustness, of course, they provide a stronger confirmation. So now that we have talked about the right replication first, and then this interplay of a different kinds of um, replications that before concerning their dependence and independence um, with respect to original uh, study, we can also talk about conceptual replications. So it seems that here there is a spectrum of possible conceptual replications that scientists perform, right? So we have Planck, Schuess, and CCH, they all utilize different methods. So they all count for conceptual replications. They all check for validity and accuracy. However, of course, Planck is highly um, different uh, from Schuess and CCH. They use completely different methods. Why Schuess and the TRGB, they actually adopt more or less the same method and they share even the same systematics. So we see that within the category of conceptual application, there is a spectrum of um, less or um, higher um, independent experiment. So now if we go back to the resampling account of replication, we often by Mashari, we can actually say that it's very important to maintain both the notion of replicability um, and so direct and conceptual because they serve for different functions, right? So direct replications assess the reliability, precision, while conceptual replication assess the validity of an experiment. And the problem with the machinery account was that all replications were resampling. So they were just used to assess for reliability, okay? And there was no room for validity. We had 
So replication to check for reliability, we had extension, we had other experiments, but there was no room for um, experiments that check for validity and whether we were targeting the very same hypothesis of a original one. So just before concluding, um, let me just say that, okay, maturity might actually tell us that we should treat the CCH as not a repli conceptual replication as we understood it, but as an act of resampling. Why? Well, suppose that we have the whole population of standard candles, right? And then inside we have a sample that um, is all of CFIX and another sample, which is all ITRGB, right? And then uh, we can just uh, say, well, look, you know, the CCH is just uh, resampling from this from the same population of uh, standard candles. Before there were like C fits in the shoes program, now they are actually um the RTRGB. Okay. And so then one can just, you know, take all tests regardless of whether they are, you know, from CCH or shoes. And then, you know, we just aggregate the results as one aggregates the samples in normal sampling experiments. But this would hide the discordance between different kinds of experiment. So only, only if we actually acknowledge that the experiments are different and they're using different methodology, different systematics, then, and they are more or less independent one from another, and that this is not only an act of resampling. We can actually appreciate the work and effort of astrophysicists who are trying to come up with um, really a reason for this discrepancy. Where they are trying to analyze the sources of error and try to overcome this discrepancy. Okay, so I hope that I've showed that replication is crucial in experimental practice, both direct and conceptual. We need both reliability and validity, of course, in science. And this, uh, um, um, these uh, values are really checked by performing different kinds of replication. There are replications and a different um, degrees of uh, um, conceptual replications. And so it would be a mistake to conflate the types of error or to just abandon the um, category of conceptual replication. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much. That was really great. Thank uh, you. So we'll take questions both from in the room and, and on Zoom. Um, Anybody want to? Get us started. Yeah. Um, so, I'll wait. yeah, I, the argument you made is, I think, very compelling. I completely agree with you that there is value in different experiments which are independent, either fully or partially. I mean, this is how we do astronomy, and what you're saying is exactly the way we approach this problem. That part is fine. I had a kind of more general question about systematic errors. So you talk mm -hmm. about known systematics, and you know people deal with that. We do the best we can. We put some error estimates, but every experiment is potentially also a source of unknown systematics, which you mentioned. But what do we do about that? Because if it's unknown. It means that we cannot estimate its magnitude. We cannot estimate which mm -hmm. which direction the error goes. And this is true for every experiment in every branch of science. We just ignore it, I think. Uh, mm. Is there a better approach? Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. So, yeah, maybe you can help me understand better this. Because so um, in what I was uh, thinking was that... So in order to detect whether there are unknown systematic error, which you are completely unaware of, then you can use very highly independent uh, experiments that target the same hypothesis, but then they adopt uh, very different methods, right? They don't share the same systematic. So if there is a discordance there, then you kind of know that there are some unknown systematic errors that you don't know. 
right? You don't know about. And then, of course, you can't deal with them. Okay, so you, you don't know how to bound them, how to quantify them, how to tackle with them. And then my attempt was to try to understand how astrophysicists deal with this. And in my um, understanding, um, Friedman would say, okay, well, we don't know, but I come up with a conjecture, okay? I come up with a conjecture that uh, there might be some systematic errors affecting the CFIX that we are not aware about. And so then, of course, then once you have this conjecture and you're trying to, um, uh, you know, check for this kind of systematic errors, you are not unknown anymore, right? I mean, so, but this is the process, right? From a situation where you do not know where your systematic errors come from and how to deal with them. You have no, absolutely no clue how to quantify them to a situation where you can deal with them, you can quantify and they are known. So I was trying to understand how the process goes. And it seemed to me that the process goes in this way that you have to come up with some conjecture. And it might, and, and so then you have to build up a replication study that basically changes the component of the original experiment where you think that is the source, uh, that you think is the source of systematic errors. Would you agree with this? Yeah, I think whenever this succeeds and you are able to identify a potential systematic, you have already moved it to the known systematics. Yeah, and I I know how to deal with that. But you know, if there yeah. is a hypothetical unknown that nobody knows yeah. what it is, there's nothing we can do. We just ignore it. And it seems to me that there's yeah. no option. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I totally understand your point. I mean, um, also Marie again wrote a paper on this. And um, so when I talked to her, she was actually thinking that there is another category of unknown, unknown systematic <laughs> errors. Uh, but yeah, maybe that is a little bit like, uh, yeah. Um, but yes, I, I totally get your point that once you come up with a conjecture and you, you know, but then they are already kind of known. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Priya. Hi, um, thanks Vera for a very interesting talk. I just had a couple of comments. First, I think, as I mentioned, I mean, I think the the word blame is not sort of particularly yeah. interesting or useful yeah. here. And yeah. second, I think the claim that an experiment may be wrong is also not quite the right word mm. here. Because mm. I think the point is that experiments, these experiments are independent. But the error could be coming not because the, I mean, the experiment is not wrong because it can measure what the observable is, right? That would be a wrong experiment that you, uh, you have the wrong methodology mm -hmm. to measure something. These are the right measurable quantities. These are the right ways to approach them. But it is um, um, an error, an underestimate of the errors of measurement and inference from those measurements. So I think mm -hmm. I phrase it that way that you know what you have here are the limits of these experiments that are not appropriately quantified and acknowledged right so that's why there's a continuity yeah. but i think it would be very useful for you to also put it in the context of the fact that you know this mm -hmm. is not the only direction from which tensions are emerging with the lambda cdm model so there are many mm -hmm. other observations yeah. now on small and large scales from which we see that there are tensions with lambda CDM. So when you present yeah. motivation for this very nice argument that you're talking about for replicability and the case for replicability, it would be nice to foreground it in that yeah. context. And I think then there is a fundamental limitation with all experiments, all these experiments in lambda CDM. And that has to do with the fact that the results are always can only be uh, compared to observations when they've been folded in with the model. So if you take plants, mm -hmm. 
you have to assume a growth of perturbation spectrum huh. and, uh, to derive the anisotropy power spectrum and then and then compare. So, you know, everything, yeah. has, all these observations have to be folded in with the very model that you are trying to test on, right? Mm. So I think it would be good for you to make that kind yeah. of clear cut. That's a very interesting philosophical point, which is not lost on the kinds of arguments you're making. But yeah, thanks for a really nice talk. Well, thank you. Thank you for all your suggestion. Yeah, probably instead of blame maybe I should have said something like responsible or yeah I mean but yes I, I also yeah. account for account for account for thank you thank you yeah account for good yeah then I also really liked your comments that it's not that the result is wrong okay um and here I, I think that maybe I should stress some more that actually even like I mean, errors are kind of like uncertainties. Like, it's not that if, uh, you know, a result uh, have some error, it means that it's wrong. It suggests that, you know, there are some uncertainties that, you know, have to be taken into consideration. And so, and these uncertainties can be the best defense of an astrophysicist, right? Because uh, it leads to more kind of digging more. And so thank you very much for pointing me to that. And yeah, also, I I was not really uh, focusing now on the problems of the Lambda CDM model, but this is something that is really important because, for instance, Ceres really uh, insists on this, that uh, it's not only the Hubble constant controversy. That, so thank you, because this is really important. And yes, also the fact that we can actually have uh, meaningful results for Planck, only once we incorporate the uh, Lambda CDM model. And so that basically the results are meaningful, but they are theoretically laden, so to say. So that's also something important that I should stress. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, very useful, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, like in these in the in this category that you call extensions, uh, you mentioned that there were samplings of uh, different populations. Uh, how how I would think naively that uh, when you when you change from CPITs to uh, TRGBs, that's a resampling of a different population. Is this why why don't they why are they not the same thing? Yeah, thank you. So within uh, uh, my Count, right? We have always to decide what counts as population. Because according to his account, replications consist of resampling from the same population. So then what is a popul population? And we have to draw some kinds of boundaries, right? And th the problem is that this uh, is based on interpretative choices. So Suppose that I have my C fix, right? And then I say, well, look, you know, I have the sample of C fix, but, you know, maybe they are located in a part of the universe where metallicity is the problem. So, so I, I look to this sample to check, you know, then you can say, oh, you are resample, resampling from the right same population because it's C fix, okay? Um, and that's already an issue because if you are concerned about the systematics and then maybe, you know, there are some metallicity more present for, or it's more serious for one sample than another, then you, you have problem because you're not really resampling. I mean, it's, you know, your sample is not truly representative of the population. I mean, you're introducing new systematics and things get more serious when, uh, you know, you, you 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 say, oh, you know, I have my whole population of standard candles. And for this uh, intermediate distances, they're useful to calculate these intermediate distances. And then, you know, I can have C base, I can have tip of the range, I am branch, and, you know, I can just change one instead of the other, right? Um, I mean, this is this is a possible, but then you have to acknowledge that since you bring different systematics, what you are doing is not mere resampling. 
So we are not in the case that we have a properly randomized sample. And then just by changing the sample, you check for precision only because they both the samples are true representatives of the whole population. Actually, in this case, astrophysicists, yes, change, they even call them samples. But in reality, what they want to do, the epistemic function of this procedure is to check for systematics. And so then uh, with the machinery account, this is not this is not accounted for because within Mashuri's account is like, okay, you change the sample so you just check for reliability. Yeah, I, I hope I I I I understood your question and I answered. Yeah, I think so. Thanks. Uh, okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, maybe I should insist more on this. Yeah, thank you. Well, we've got um I a couple of minutes left, so maybe time for one more question. Um, I have a question. Peter? Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. so there was exactly the, the question, yeah, of, of the errors. Yeah, I had a different question now. Um, if you do an experiment that presupposes uh, the result of a previous experiment, but doesn't replicate it directly, is that a conceptual replication? What is the status of an experiment um, that you know, so suppose you are at CERN. No one's going to give you, you know, one hundred fifty million dollars, one hundred million dollars to run an experiment that's the same as one that was run somewhere else. So they're going to, you're going to propose some new experiment that presupposes it. Um, now, if it doesn't work out, you'll say you failed to replicate. But if it does work out, probably it'll go without much comment. But still. Um, that's more like the routine of high expense, high stake, high collaboration experiments. Because you, you simply yeah. won't get an astrophysical, you know, grant to do an expensive yeah, exactly. application that has yes. that either confirms or denies an earlier result. You have to there has to be something novel in what you propose. Mm. So how does that change? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I would recall this conceptual replication. Yes, I would say that this is an instance of conceptual replication. So as long as you check the very same hypothesis or you want to confirm the very same result, um, but then you do it in a different way, different uh, methods, then this is conceptual replication. And there has been a whole issue about this, about the fact that scientists do not find the grants to pay for direct replications. So no one is going to pay for the very same experiment, right? I mean, it's already done. Uh, money has been already given uh, for that experiment. So why are you, why do you want to replicate directly in the sense, why do you want to duplicate the same ex ex experiment? And, um, and then the problem is that then, of course, the scientists are more encouraged to do conceptual replications. But then we have a discordant results, right? Uh, most of the time because the systematic errors are extremely difficult to compute. And the problem of this whole replication crisis literature that you know philosophy um, of science literature is targeting is that the like the thought is that actually many of these experiments have not been directly replicated enough because there were not enough funds. And so the thought is if, uh, uh, you know, if a science, scientific foundations uh, gave more funds for direct replications, then it would be extremely useful because now we're at the stage that we have too many conceptual replications, too many discordant results. And sometimes it's just because uh, your precision, like your random errors have not been accounted to well, or there was even some problems with the experiment that could not even replicate it directly. Maybe, I don't know, in psychology, some more subjective elements or something like that. Or maybe some instruments that, that you know, don't work properly. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.
Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this has been a really fantastic talk. Really interesting. Um, thank you. Thank you for inviting another, me. Yeah, we have another talk coming out of this room, but um, we can love thank you again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a nice Thanks. day. Thanks, you too. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. See you. See you.